Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Van Buren Variety Show. As you know, I am Bob Van Buren, your host. Once a week, so glad you're here, not only to the people that tune in week after week, but those newcomers that I know that are out there watching. So, welcome aboard. And if this is your first time to tune into the show, let me just kind of give you a summary of what it's all about. The name of the channel is Van Buren Variety, and we'll stretch or stress the word variety. It's exactly what it is. Every week, there's an interesting guest on to talk about an interesting topic. It could be the person's profession. It could be a how-to segment. It might be the person's hobby. Or they might even play some musical instruments or some kind of entertainment. So, never know what you're going to get week after week. So, make sure you hit that subscribe button. It just takes a few seconds to do that. And then by doing that, you can keep up with future episodes and see what guests are coming up. And you can also make sure if you really like the guest and you like the topic, hit that like button as well. I'm sure our guests would appreciate that. Those of you that are watching live, uh, you can be interactive. You can ask our guests questions as we go along. But if you're watching this days, weeks, months, even after this interview is over, don't worry. If you still have a question for the guest, you can still leave a comment, and I will make sure that our guest sees that, and uh, hopefully he or she will get back to you and answer your interesting questions. So, again, welcome to the Van Buren Variety Show. Hope you've all had a great week. As always, I have a very interesting guest tonight to talk about a great topic. Let me tell you a little about something that I have been looking at lately. Uh, one of my hobbies, or one of the things I like to do, is look up unusual cars, or cars you really haven't heard of a whole lot, or those that have kind of been forgotten. Maybe sometimes they are glad to be forgotten, but I came across a, an interesting looking car. And maybe y'all not think it's so interesting, but it was never sold in the United States. Reason being, it was mostly behind the Iron Curtain in Europe. If you don't know what the Iron Curtain was, well, Europe was divided. There was the democracy side and then there was the socialist or communist side. Well, this car I found looking interesting. It was sold in uh, then East Germany. And I did some research on the car and I'll show it to you and explain to you what this car is. It's very unique, would you say? <laughs> the name of the car is a Trabant. That's T R A. B-A-N-T. And I just, I don't know, the style of the car really uh, kind of stands out for me. And most of the cars were blue. But I have to say, in all honesty, you know, looks can be deceiving. It is ranked, the Trabant here is ranked as the absolute number one worst car ever made. Uh, it was made with very, very cheap materials and... Um, I think a lot of the uh, Germans that owned these cars, as soon as the wall came down, they dumped them. But I have to say, I don't know. There's just something about the looks of that car I like. And they called it, they always called it uh, the engine that went in this car. It could also run your local weed eater. That's about how powerful that thing was. A two-stroke engine, I believe is what they said. But I've done some research on it, but I just think it's unique. Like I said, you don't see these in America. Uh, maybe that's a good thing, but uh, there are some Trabant enthusiasts out there. So anyway, I wanted to share that with you. I think it's an interesting looking car. It is the Trabant 601. And uh, of course, obviously, they don't make them anymore. So I'll let you judge if that's a good thing or a bad thing. So <laughs> anyway, welcome to the show again. And I have to ask the question, have you read a good book yesterday? Uh, good book lately. Let's put lately in there. Well, if you haven't, then I might have one, two, maybe even three books that will spark your interest. And before I tell you about them, why don't we let the author come on and tell you about his books and his personal experience. So without further ado, let me bring my guest on for tonight's show. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce you to Gregory Eric Phillips. He's written so many great books lately. We're going to be talking about some of the, his latest book, uh, that he wrote, which we're going to be talking about. It's called A Season in Light. So if that title itself is intriguing you, what do you hear the details? So Gregory, welcome to the Van Buren Variety Show. Thanks, Bob. Great, great to be on. And I just have to say, I can't wait to see the reactions when you drive that Trabot around the Dallas freeways. <laughs> you might get <laughs> some makes, looks. <laughs> if it, yeah, if it makes it that far. <laughs> yeah, now, um, in fact, uh, the, the German word for fast is schnell it really is s-c-h-n-e-l-l -L. 
but someone made a comment, is it Ron Schnell or Snail? Like, <laughs> that's about how it was. They couldn't tell the difference. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure a lot of Germans could attest that those were not good cards, but I just I thought it looked kind of funny. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like yeah. the Interesting. Yeah. I, would I own one? Probably not, uh, but interesting in yeah. the less. <laughs> Yeah. Well, let's talk about your uh, your profession, Gregory. Sure, yeah. Uh, let's just kind of start from the beginning. How long have you written, and when did you get interested in sort of like writing? Well, I I've been writing almost my whole life. I from the very from my earliest memories, I was uh, fascinated by storytelling. I was a big reader from as soon as I you know really could, oh, and really? I actually wrote my first full novel when I was fourteen. And it was absolutely dreadful, but you know, I did it. And then I kept writing and uh -huh. um, started to really improve my craft. And eventually in um, uh, 2017 or 18 was when I had my first novel published. Um, oh, wow. So it was not young. <laughs> almost, yeah, but it was almost, well, nearly 20 years. For, you know, from when I first started mm -hmm. to then, you know, get my craft to a place where it was, it was ready for the, for the sure. public. So long journey, but um, it's been rewarding. And now I've, as you mentioned, I've had three novels published and it's been a, a great journey and a great ride. And I'm very excited about it. How did, can I ask, how did you get published? I mean, once you finished like your first work, did you self-publish? Did you look around for a publisher? How did you decide, to, I've got my book now, where right, do I go yeah. with it? How, how, well, how did it come about? Well, I never, I, I didn't want to self-publish because for me, especially having written a, a number of books that have not been published, starting with mm -hmm. that one as a teenager, I I felt that I wanted the the validation of a company in the industry saying, we want to back this. Mm -hmm. So where self-publishing, you can talk, your, as an author, you can talk yourself into sometimes something being better than it was. And oh, so I, I made the decision that I'm not going to self-publish. I'm going to keep working until I can get a traditional publisher. And how that door opened was my first novel, uh, which was called Love of Finished Years. It, uh, it won a major literary award in 2015. That one? Yes. Okay. And I, I entered the award with just the manuscript. It, oh, I hadn't really? been able to get it, get it published, and it was the only manuscript that has ever won this award. It's called the Chanticleer International oh, wow. book, book Reviews Award. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And so that, to me, was incredibly validating because having worked for 20 years at this craft and thinking, oh, I don't know if it's good enough, to have, you know, to, to win that honor. And then that really opened the door because then that gave me visibility. And then a publisher said, okay, we want to publish this. And so that was my first novel that, um, that got published. And then I've had two more since. Absolutely. Well, that takes a lot of talent. I've, I've written some stuff here and there, but nothing, nothing worth, you know, publishing. I haven't polished it or nothing like that. So mm -hmm. it is a craft, you know, it's a, uh, you have to be really dedicated. So let's talk about your, well, let's talk about your last book or your yeah. most recent book. No, it's not your last book. No, nope. <laughs> your most recent book. Let's put it that yes. way. Okay. And it is called a season in lights and I'm intrigued by the cover and I read yeah. the preface already, but here's a lady that looks like she's doing ballet or, or dancing. And uh, if I could just kind of, kind of take a side street here you have experience in dancing tell us about your your dancing then we'll get into the book here yeah so uh i am a a dancer as well as a musician All so right. i've done um, a lot of stage performances in the past and i i lived uh, in new york city for about a year and a half and oh, wow. danced in several off-broadway shows and that experience sort of gave the inspiration for this novel it's not based on my personal experiences so much mm -hmm. as inspired by them. And so what I wanted to do with this novel is give a sort of a backstage glimpse into the lives of these performers, performing artists. Sure. And not so much, you know, there's a lot of books written or movies done about people who make it big on Broadway or on, in Hollywood. And I wanted to show the story of the people who maybe don't make it big who mm -hmm. just they're struggling to make a living in these back alley theaters 
but they love what they do and they're passionate about it. And mm -hmm. they, they just get a rush out of the performance, which sure. I've, I've felt myself. So that was the story I wanted to tell, which I don't think has been told all that often. And that was really fun to do and just um, show some of the personalities you'll meet in those environments or some of the little struggles that they have. Mm. So, yeah. So that was I, kind I, of the, the germ of it. I agree with you. And uh, that story needs to be told because a lot of people, they see the, the Hollywood glamour or Broadway. And yeah. not every story is like a star is born. Exactly. You know, so you're telling me. 99% the other... of them are, are not. And unfortunately not. So yeah. let's uh, let me show the, the uh, book cover again. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a young lady on this cover. And uh, mm -hmm. tell us kind of about without giving us all the, the you know, the giving away the, all the uh, details. But, uh, you know, what is what kind of character is she? Would yeah. You say? So she is uh, the the protagonist of the story. Her name is Cammy. Cammy. She's uh -huh. uh, a ballet a trained ballet dancer in her early 30s okay. who moves from. Pennsylvania to New York City who wants to give it a shot and she's in great shape she's super talented but she's older than most of the people who you know she's auditioning against and um, mm -hmm. performing with she, you know unfortunately for uh, for ballet dancers especially for you know female ballet dancers once you get into your 30s you're they're not the People want the up and comers. They want to cast the up and comers. Kind of like a and senior so, citizen already. Like exactly. Sort of... Yeah. Mm. So it's that. I, that's another nuance of the story I wanted to show because whether it's in dancing or any field, you know, many of us have experienced something similar. And so Cami, she does have some small successes in in mm -hmm. New York, that's and good. the the story opens with her doing her first big show um although it's an off-broadway show in a funky little theater but it's gotta start it's a, somewhere it's a show, it's a show. <laughs> um and then kind of showing her struggles with balancing this dream of hers with practical concerns and family concerns because the, she has a very complicated relationship with her um her family who live in pennsylvania who she left um behind to go to new york mm -hmm. and having to come to terms with some things about her family, about herself and, um, and make eventually needs to make some difficult decisions. Uh, there's the book really tells two stories in parallel. One okay. is the present day story of Cammy, this ballet dancer. And the second is the story of an older piano player. Um, Tom. Well, Tom. Yes. Yeah, well, uh -huh. he's, he's older and when we meet him in the story, but then we mm -hmm. go back and see his story when he was a, a young, idealistic uh, piano player who came to New York City similarly to try to make a living. Oh, wow. And there's and Cammie and Tom have this beautiful um, relationship where they um, have these shared experiences, but a generation apart. And the the two stories became they became even more intertwined than I realized they would be by the time I'd written. Oh, really? and it was a, a good parallel of two different perspectives, but of, um, of a story that sort of continues to be told in a different way yeah. over and over again. So you're saying you hear, we hear Cammy's story in the book, then mm -hmm. we hear Tom's story and then they kind of merge, I guess you could say. Yeah. Yeah, they do. I like they that. Do. Cause mm -hmm. that way you're, you're hearing two, I guess you say points of view. Or yeah. two experiences, should I say? Yes, yes. And um, now he's an older person than her, right? Yes, yes. Um, so he's about 20 years older than her. Uh, and so the in the earlier section that, that takes place in the mid-1980s, he's um, very young. He's younger than she is in the, pres in the present day. Present day, I see. Um, and, the, and so then he's able to kind of give convey some wisdom to her too which he does very subtly because he's a he's a quiet type of guy he's oh, not I a see. big he's not a big talker but not he, forceful he's, okay no <laughs> but he subtly conveys some wisdom to her to help her value her experiences that where you know this where he tells her this this show that you're doing this might be the high points you mm -hmm. don't know you're and 
uh, performing artists are always reaching toward that next thing. And that's a theme of sure. the book too. But oftentimes it's the, the small successes or the journey along the way that is really Absolutely. the most valuable. Absolutely. So how long, uh, Gregory, did it take you to write this particular book? I mean, did, did when I, I, I don't know, I'm not, I don't write, you know, a mm -hmm. book professionally like you do. So like when you write a book and we'll use this last book as an example, when you started writing, I mean, what's, what was your time length? Did it take you a few months, a year, or how, how long did it take you to finally finish the finished product? Great question. And <laughs> if you ask me that question about all three of my novels, the answer is vastly different. Like, years really? different for all three um because sometimes because it's, it's seldom in a straight line the the closest thing to a straight line that i wrote any of my novels was my middle novel the exile which i wrote the first draft of that in about nine months got it edited second yeah. draft mm -hmm. it got published within about two years so that was okay. that was very fast um a season in lights though i actually started even earlier than i started the exile I started this one, I think I started writing it in 2015. And it's been a while. it just, it kind of, I wrote the first, sort of the first um, third or so of it. Mm -hmm. um, it's really in three chunks. And I call it a novel in three acts to, you know, kind of go with the theater theme. Um, so what became act one happened fairly quickly, but then I got bogged down. I eventually wrote the, what I thought was a finished version of the novel mm -hmm. had it done in 2019. And okay. I started trying to get it published. Um, but I still felt like there was something missing from it. It was, mm -hmm. it was just a good story, but it needed something more details. And, well, uh, well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. So if in, then in March, 2020, the pandemic hit yeah, Broadway, sure. Broadway shut down. And I thought, wow, this as a performer, my heart just went out to those performing artists who not only this is their livelihood, but their very identities and they can't do it anymore. They out can't of work. Dance. They mm -hmm. can't dance. They can't sing. They can't um, perform. Yeah. They can't earn money. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, that's the kind of thing I want to tell that story in fiction. And I thought, and the light bulb moment went on. I have a fully finished novel about performing artists in New York City. I am going to write a new ending. And so I wrote what became act three of this novel. I wrote it in March of 2020, literally as the events I was describing of the novel were happening, which as a wow. writer, that's such a unique um, experience that could sure. never be replicated really. And I really like the way the, the, the current ending of the novel turned out because even now, two years later, having written it at that time, not knowing how anything was going to play out, not knowing all of the ways that the whole COVID conversation became divisive. Sure. And mm -hmm. um, it, was more, it was at a time we were all just scared and uncertain and we were like, what is going on? Absolutely. And I feel like I captured that in the novel. And then as, of course, it takes another year to get it published, but I intentionally didn't edit that section too closely because after we, we've learned more, once things became, um, you know, more argumentative between, you know, different factions in the country and so forth, I wanted it to just convey that pure uncertainty and fear, especially in New York City, which was where oh, it was the boy. worst. Ground zero. Yeah. You know? So that was, that was what the novel needed. And, and I was so glad that I didn't end up getting it published earlier because it's a much stronger book and a much more, much more of an encapsulating of the times sure. because of that. I'm going to ask you about that. Uh, now, not counting your last most recent book, mm -hmm. but like for the first two books that you wrote uh, as an author, when you have like a storyline and you start writing a book, do you, automatically or do you already know how these characters are going to end up at the end of your book like how it's going to end or as you write do you think oh they could end this way in other words you've got multiple endings in your mind or do you already set that ending up when you start writing actually neither the yeah. character almost inevitably the characters take i once the characters become fully formed they take it to an ending that i didn't expect Interesting. So, 
Yes. Oh, wow. It never really ends like I planned it. And the more I write, the less I plan. The more I just, I create a situation. I create the characters. I, I plot out where I think the book is going to go, especially for the first half of it. Yeah. And then I, I let it, I let it develop because spontaneous maybe in a way, right? Yeah. And I feel that if you get, if you as the author get too invested in mm -hmm. what you want to have happen mm -hmm. in what you want the ending to look like, you'll miss an opportunity or you'll miss yeah. a chance to, you know, to do something unique. And that's certainly what happened with, with this novel. You know, the first ending I wrote, um, you know, back in 2019, it was good. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was hard to cut it because I had to completely scrap it. Um, and it was a good ending, mm -hmm. but now I have a great ending. Well, and director's cut, because you could call yeah, it that. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. So, you know, sometimes it uh sometimes it surprises you less than other times. Sometimes you you kind of know what's gonna happen. Um uh my first novel is a um, Love of Finished Years. It's a historical novel. So being mm -hmm. tied to historical events, uh, very closely to historical events, I had a pretty good idea of how it was going to end because, mm -hmm. you know, things were happening as in the world, you know. Sure, absolutely. And um, though it still, it still had some, some nuance with the ending that I didn't expect that kind of came in um, last minute and some of it even suggested by my publisher of like, Ooh, what, what if this happened? And I thought that's a great idea. That's a good idea for sure. Yeah. Well, let's kind of, while we got this book up, let's talk about yeah. this one. Now, this is your first novel mm -hmm. yes. called Love of Finished Years. And uh, I'm looking at the young lady uh, in the title. She's dressed more, if I could say 1930s, 1940s. Is that the period here? Or a little earlier, actually. A little earlier, actually. This is um, more uh, 19 teens. 19 teens. Yeah. Okay. Tell us about the book. So, yeah, so this is um, a World War One era, World and War I. Um, the years sort of New York City again in the years leading up to the First World War, and it follows the family of uh, it follows a German immigrant family uh, in okay. you know in their early years in New York City, and then the later part of the book uh, coincides with America's entry into the First World War, I see. and follows one of the characters who goes. To who has deployed to France mm. and um, and through the the um, and it's also it's a love story it's um, um, it's just a beautiful beautiful story and part of why I wanted to um, I wanted to show the German the German immigrants to show a little bit of the their experience once the United States goes to war against Germany and these German Americans um, having some you oh, know I see persecution and their stuff. homeland you know yeah um but then also world war one I, I find to be you just like i said with the theater book that i wanted to show the untold story of the mm -hmm. the small theaters you know similarly there's so much told about world war ii and so much books and movies there it is and Saving World Private War, Ryan, they go on yeah. and on and on <laughs> and it's and it's easy to see why it's a, you know it's there was many compelling storylines. It was a very clear good versus evil situation. World War One is is much messier, and there's not. It's, you know, it's not so clear. It's like there there was no good guy, good guys. They were all bad guys, pretty yeah. much. Mm -hmm. You know, it was it was a, a pointless war, but of course a devastating one. And so, you know, in sure. school and everything, I always learned so much about World War II. And my the way my brain works is, I think, well, what about this other thing that happened? You know, twenty five years prior earlier? to that, that yeah. must mm -hmm. have played a part. And so I became fascinated and became a student of the First World War, and um, that then that fascination and that study led me to want to. Uh, write a novel set at that time. And I actually have a draft of another novel that hasn't been published oh, wow. yet set around World War One as well. Without giving any of the details away, but I have mm -hmm. to ask, you said it was about German immigrants mm -hmm. that came over here during World War One or before World War One. Before, yeah. Would, would Is there any character in there that maybe has split loyalties? Maybe they're now Americans, but they still feel attachment to Germany. Sometimes there's split loyalties there. I don't right. want to give anything away, but... There, there really weren't in no. in my book. No, there, there, and and I did a lot of research too. Is that, that at that time, people 
they really wanted to assimilate as Americans. Americans, I see. Um, whether they're from Germany or Hungary or, you know, um, wherever they came from, Italy. Uh, <clears throat> they're proud of their heritage, but, it, you know, it wasn't a... So the, the characters in this book are more trying to prove their Americanness more than, you know, so that they don't get, you know, associated with the Germans. The, the and, quote and, enemy, yeah. <laughs> yes. And honestly, part of that is a survival thing because they're all poor. They don't, they don't care about politics. They don't, they left Germany because their lives there weren't very good. So it's, you know, they're just trying to survive. Absolutely. They're not, they're not really even caring who the, you know, who yeah. wins the war. You know, I am kind of into uh, World War One in a way. Uh, Are you? I've been watching a lot of the, uh, as my viewers have known, uh, I, I got a list of all the movies that have ever won Best Picture in the Academy Awards from 1921, 1929 until now. Mm -hmm. And the early days, it was about World War One. Mm -hmm. In yeah. fact, the Best Picture of 1929 was a silent movie called Wings. Hmm. which I would highly recommend it. Yeah. And then the, the movie after that was a sound picture with, you know, you was talking and it was called all quiet on the Western front. Yes. 1930. I, and so, yeah, it kind of sparked a, my interest. That is an amazing, well, I read the book first of all quiet on the Western oh, front, but the, the movie was also very well done. And this is, uh, this is not always the case, but very true to the book. I felt is so, it? Yeah. No, I have not seen 1917. People have talked about it, but yeah. I haven't seen it. So, mm -hmm. but have you seen it? It's a good movie. I have. Yeah, it's okay. good. It's good. It's a, you know, it's, it's really visually compelling in a way that those earlier movies couldn't be because they didn't have the sure. technology. Sure. Um, so I feel it really gave a, a good gritty feel for how some of those, um, those devastating battles um, just, yeah know, would have felt things that couldn't show in film you know yeah 50 60 yeah. 70 80 years ago mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah okay well interesting gregory uh we'll say we we talked about that one that one looks that sounds so interesting mm -hmm. uh, but then your second book uh yeah it was uh called the exile and it kind of makes me think does the title pretty much is it a symbolic title or it really is someone who was in exile no, uh -huh. it's it's really about a, an exile. It's um, okay. it's about a, um, a Colombian American um, immigrant who's facing a who she and her family are facing a deportation crisis, and oh, wow. wanting to put readers into the into the head of or into the heart of these people and kind of show sure. that um, experience because I have a I have many personal friends who've been in that that situation. Um, it's also interestingly set in the time of the um, 2008, uh, 2007 and 2008 mortgage crisis. Time, oh, and, I the Freddie Mac and the Fannie Mae yep. stuff. Oh, yes, and I remember that. You'll notice you'll notice a theme here of mine. Um, there's again, there's books and movies told about that crisis from the perspective of the big Wall Street bankers. You know, the big shorts, things like mm -hmm. that. Yep. very little told from the small time mortgage brokers just on the street hustling to make a living. And so that's here what I wanted to, to show is just these, the frontline workers who are not making a huge income, but just trying to survive in the subprime mortgage business. And some of them doing it honorably, some of them cutting corners mm -hmm. and doing it a little bit shady because they need to make a living or they're pressured by their bosses. So again, the, the untold story, again, the, that's the theme of mine um, and show that sort of back, back room uh, view of what was happening in those mortgage offices and how it affected these people. And especially how it affected this um, Latin American immigrant who knows that if she does anything wrong, she's getting she's you gone. Know, she's gone. You know, so and the, the just the pressure and the um, the the, the ever-present fear that that creates. And I'm seeing a common thing, even though the, the families in this story mm -hmm. are different from the one that you had from your first novel, but it does deal with immigrants. Yeah, who's yeah. trying to live, I guess, in their own way, the American dream. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. 
Did you get uh, any? What was? Did you have any kind of inspiration on this particular story? Anybody you knew personally that this involved or was about, or did you just kind of think of this on your own, or how did you come across the the storyline for the Exile? You know, it's um, no specific inspiration of a person. Um, the uh, uh, you know, I mentioned I'm a dancer. Most of my dancing sure. has been um, Latin dancing, like tango, mm -hmm. salsa. Um, wow, you but, got it all. <laughs> things, like, things like that. And so through that, I, I'm i friends and in the community. I'm I'm really in the Latin American community very oh, close. And good. so, you know, I have, but I know people who, you know, would be at the, at the salsa dance one week and they were gone the next and none of us ever saw them again. Oh, and no. You know, because they got deported. You know, and it's it. So it's 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 a real thing that kind you of touch see. you personally. Yeah, yeah. and um, so that was kind of what put the inspiration on my heart to want to put um, you know a character who's facing that um, that fear. Uh, but I also wanted to create a story, and the exile is probably the the most. There's aspects of love story in all three of my novels, but the exile is would be the closest it's not a romance novel but it's you know the love story is very key to that sure book, more so than my other other two and i wanted to tell i'm it's hard in present day to sometimes find the same sort of star-crossed love story that you that you have mm -hmm. in in older times but this situation allowed me to do that because um she be the, the woman being Latin American and her love interest is um, from a family that would not accept her. Mm -hmm. And that led to some, I think it led to a compelling storyline um, to be able to, and I, you know, I won't go into too many details because sure. I don't want to give away the story. It's very it's, personal though. It's, it's very, very personal. personal. And it's become, and it's actually um, uh, a very suspenseful novel because there Sounds because of some of these factors ha happening so if you're if any of your listeners are into um, the romantic suspense sort of genre this novel kind of leans toward that without mm. quite fitting the genre because my novels don't really fit a genre very well people ask me oh what's your genre and I don't really have one you know there's <laughs> there's the ro romance here there's the historical there's the literary aspect it's just you know I tell Mystery. the stories as, <laughs> as they come to me you know, if I had to put it in a bucket, which may not be, this is yeah. right, but you talk about being a mystery and kind of a romance. I think of the old 1940s film noir yeah, movies. I love that genre. And so, like, you know, uh, the Maltese Falcon comes into mind, you yeah. know. So uh, it's kind of, I guess you could almost, I don't think it's a fair comparison. That's how I would think about it when you say yeah. that. Well, yeah. I mean, sort of the, the film noir style brought into present day would be okay. more, you know. Okay. Well, uh, Gregory, uh, now not only are you a writer, uh, you are also, you also have your own website, which we'll bring up right here. Mm -hmm. uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's HTTPS Gregory Eric Phillips, that's E R I C H Phillips.com. So, uh, Gregory, if my listeners or anybody here was to go to your website, uh, what would they see there? What all information do yeah. you have on your website? Well, first, first of all, just note the spelling of my middle middle name. Yes. And for those of you who know, and I mentioned the German immigrants, you see a little bit of a German connection there. So <laughs> there, there is that. Um, so my website, I have you know links where you can buy all of my books. I have some, uh, you know, you can link to some more things like this that I've done. Um, some blog blogs that I have up there. Um, mainly, I use it as a site for people to you know be able to find where to buy my books. Um, which you can buy wherever books are sold online, um, you know, bookstore. If your local bookstore doesn't have it, just ask them to order it. Um, they're on Amazon and, you know, all the, all the good stuff. Um, but, you know, my website's a good place to find them, learn more about me, um, read a little bit more about my, um, you know, my style, my, sure. you know, more detail about the books. There's also um, it's kind of fun. There's some book club questions on my website. So oh, really? it if sounds you interesting. are a member of, of a book club, um, all three of my novels have been popular with book clubs. So um, those book club questions can kind of spark conversations. And if you have a book club meeting and you want to bring me in on Zoom, I'm always happy to do that. 
So they can contact you through this uh, website right mm -hmm. here. Absolutely. Yes. Oh, right. That sounds interesting. So, and that was my next question. You kind of answered it. So they can order your books through here mm -hmm. or, or just go to their local bookstore like Barnes and Noble or something. Yep. So yep. very, very interesting. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, remember that is Gregory Eric Phillips.com, but Eric is E R I C H. So, uh, if you leave the H out, don't know why, where that takes you, but uh, <laughs> it's E R I C H Phillips.com. I want to ask you, uh, Greg, on your, or Gregory, on your books, uh, what audience? I mean, are they, can anybody read it or is it more for like a mature adult? You know, and is there anything, what would be a target audience? Is it an adult book? Can a, a high school or a junior high school read it? Yeah, it's, um, it, I, it's mainly for uh, adults. Um, there's um, a, for I, I don't think high, it would be inappropriate at all for high schoolers. I would say they're probably PG rated. So, okay. you know, there's a, there's, a <laughs> there's a little bit of stuff, but it's not, not you know, it's not too bad. Um, but, you know, for you know, younger than high school parents would want to just, you know, preview preview them for their kids to see if it's appropriate. Okay. But it's it's mainly an adult audience. I feel like my books are they they deal with um with important thematic material but mm -hmm. i write in a way that i want it to be very accessible so Absolutely. they're they're easy reads they're in terms of easy reads in terms of you'll be turning the pages and you know i don't know how people do this but some people <laughs> read them in two, the whole book in two days i don't know i can't read that i can't do that no i uh, can't <laughs> You know, so they're easy reads in that sense, but they're not necessarily easy reads in that they make you think they they probe their thought provoking books. And um, I've been told and I take this as a compliment that they stick they stick with people and they oh, remember these these characters and they remember the some of the things that they went through. And um, some of them mention it to me years later. That well, that's great. I, I like hearing positive feedback on stuff like that yeah. too. Yeah, so, I want to ask you on your three books that you've written. Uh, now, some authors uh, they either do sequels, you know, mm -hmm. or spinoffs. Is all your books are they standalone, or have you considered doing a sequel to any of your previous books? No, they're all standalone. Standalone. Um, okay, and that's simply the way I view story. Okay, I view, I view story as a as one packaged thing and mm -hmm. i could see myself doing say like a two or three book series if the whole story took that long to tell you know if it took a thousand pages to tell nobody's no people don't publish thousand page novels well no war and peace <laughs> made it no war and yeah, peace yeah that's a, that was a few years a few years ago <laughs> that was before amazon <laughs> exactly yeah. yeah yeah um but i don't you know i i don't think of stories as something that you know i want to tell something that usually takes several years or more mm -hmm. of a person's life and i'm viewing it as as it conveys kind of the significant events of this person's life i see um the, meaning the character yeah sure and mm -hmm. you know a lot of people asked me after my first novel um uh, Love of Finished Years. Are you writing a sequel? Everybody loves Elsa, the main who's the main character. We want to know more about Elsa. Oh, is and that I, her in the picture yeah. supposed to be? Okay. And I, All right. I say, I put Elsa through enough of that. I don't want to put her through <laughs> You anything. tortured her. <laughs> tortured her, poor girl. <laughs> and that's the thing. If you're going to be a novelist, you have to be pretty mean to your characters. You know, you have to put them through some stuff. Otherwise, it's not going to be interesting. So, you know, at the end of this novel, you know, the war's over. I want to imagine that Elsa has some peace. I don't want to put her through another novel. Quote, you happily know. ever after. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, um, you know, I could see myself doing something that would be more of a spinoff, like take one of the characters and then yeah, sure. I use them that. as a primary. Um, you know, A Season of Lights would lend itself to that because... You know, Cammy and Tom were the main characters, but then we saw this whole group backstage doing the production of the show. Mm -hmm. And there were some very colorful characters in that. I could take one of them 
and then write another story about that character. So I could see myself doing a spinoff more than a sequel. But so far, I haven't really been inspired to do that. It's just, you know, they they stand alone and then I'm on to the to the next. Thing. Absolutely. I kind of relate to spinoff because my show, well, it's been I've been doing the show for about a year and a half, but I'm actually a spinoff of another YouTube channel. Oh, really? So, yeah, uh, yeah I was with this channel and I'm still with them. I'm still mm -hmm. uh, producing them. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I wanted my own channel. So I guess you could say I'm a quote, Vampire and Variety is a spinoff of another channel, of a well known channel. Yeah. So, uh, so I know all about spinoffs. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have a, a comment from the audience for you, Gregory. Right. I'll show this. Um, Sandra says, a very interesting guest with a unique life. Thank you, Sandra. <laughs> So, yeah, thank you, Santa, for the, for the compliment. I was going to ask you now, you, you said you've written these three novels. You just published your last or your most recent one. Do you have any in the work? You, you don't have to tell us what it's about, but do you have any that you're thinking about or that you're already starting on? Yeah, so that's a, a tricky question right now because I have two completed drafts of novels, but I'm not quite sure that they're ready. And okay. it's fine. That's, you know, I feel under wraps. Like, <laughs> yeah, but I'm. Uh, I feel like with um, with a season of lights, especially, I'm just really, really happy with how that turned out. Mm -hmm. I mean, all three of them, but especially this one being my last, my most recent one. Um, and so I want my next book to to build on that and to be even better and to just sure. bring my craft to a to a That'd higher. Be interesting. Level. Uh -huh. And I'm this. I've been kind of going back and forth about this other one because I feel like there's some really good stuff in it, but there's some there's some holes in the plot that I don't quite know how to fix. No, you don't want a plot hole, yeah, for no. sure. <laughs> and so, rather than force a solution on it, I'm kind of thinking I need to just write something different, and then maybe a few years down the road, I'll have an inspiration to come back to that other one and fix it and bring it up to the the next level but i think that right now the best thing to do is to um to start something new and i do have a couple sure. of idea, ideas they're not quite fully formed but um i've sketched out some things so you know maybe i'll be back on your show in a in a year or two with a new book love to have so, you back on to tell you about <laughs> well i'll ask you this now if there's someone watching this live or if they're watching this days weeks or months after the show is over uh, maybe they're not a published author. Maybe they have a work that they either a, are working on and maybe they've completed it and now it's just sitting there. Yeah. And, you know, it's not edited, they just, but, but they're so confused and frustrated. He or she is just like, yeah. I got this great idea. I've written everything. I don't know what to do with it. So what would you suggest to that person as, as a published author, as a success, yes. successful author? How, what would you suggest to him or her? Get what's called a developmental edit. Developmental edit. No, there's okay. three. There's three kinds of edits that okay. happen on a book. A developmental edit is. Well, I'll start. Um, so, well, there's the developmental edit, a line edit, and a copy edit. No, oh, three of them. Mm. When most people think of editing, what they're thinking of is a line edit, which is the editor with the proverbial red pen, you know, marking stuff up, changing this or that. Misspellings or whatever. Structure and all that. Mm. The copy edit is more grammar and misspellings, catching typos, not changing the structure oh, of the man. novel at all, just catching the details before it goes to print. Um, those are valuable, especially the, the line edit. But if you have a have a draft, you're not quite sure about it, you need some feedback on it. The developmental edit is something that I learned about and has been instrumental to me as a writer. Mm -hmm. With the developmental edit, they don't mark up your manuscript at all. You send it to an editor and they send you back a letter. The first okay. one I got was a seven page, single spaced typed letter from the wow. editor <laughs> about, basically about everything that's wrong in your manuscript. So, no, but, no. <laughs> <laughs> but they're also usually, I mean, in my, in my experiences, they've also been very gracious, give positive feedback. And um, my impression with that one was that she went into such a detail with the letter because she believed in the book and oh, that's great. she believed it could work, but mm -hmm. it didn't work yet. And she, and I still have that letter and I still refer to it just for writing advice because I learned things about the craft from that. Uh -huh. So, and then after I had 
done a full, really a full rewrite of the book based on that mm -hmm. letter. Then I sent it back to the same editor for a line edit. And then she marks it up with red pen. And oh, everything. that's when she does that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, but also to, I used the same editor in that case because I wanted to say, okay, is, did I, did I hit on the things you, you pointed out? Mm -hmm. um, so for new authors out there who have, who have a finished manuscript that's sure. unpublished, you're thinking about sending it to a publisher or an agent mm -hmm. or even thinking about self-publishing it, do yourself a favor and get that developmental edit and okay. have, you know, prepare to thicken your skin when you receive it. It's, yeah. it's always hard the first time because you're close to your work and it's hard. That's for a part to of you. you. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. It's hard for people to tell you this is wrong with it, but it's not, this is wrong with it. This is an opportunity to make it better. Look at it that way. And um, so that, that's the advice I would have. That's the first, the first step. Okay. That's good advice. Cause I know there's a lot, you know, when I've heard all the time, you know, back when I was in college and even, you know, in work and I say, well, I've got this story that I've written, but I don't, I don't, I'm just sitting on it. I don't know what to do with it. So, you know, so that's, oh man, I hope that that's good advice. And I hope that helps somebody that maybe is struggling with that right now. Yeah. Did you, uh, in your career, did you take any kind of a, you said you were interested in writing, you know, back in even in high school mm -hmm. or when you were junior high, actually. And uh, did you go, like when you were in college, did you take any kind of specific, for lack of a better, creative writing classes or literature classes? Or did you just have that natural talent? <laughs> yeah, I really didn't. I mean, in retrospect, I kind of think maybe I should have been been an English major or something like that. Um, I was a music major and a dance minor. So, you know. Yeah, oh, sure. And, and I was running track. I mean, that was the main thing I was thinking about in those days. <laughs> but... Um, but since then, I have taken a lot of writing workshops, not in an mm -hmm. officially like a university program type of mm -hmm. setting. But um, I, I go to writers conferences, take classes, take online courses, um, read books about writing, um, about oh, writing wow. craft from, you know, from good authors. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, you just study it. Study, you know, if you want to you want to do this, if you want to be this kind of an artist, you need to study and you need to practice. And, um, you know, just like if you're going to learn to play a musical instrument, it's going to take years for you to become proficient yeah. at it. And that comes from a combination of studying from people who know what they're doing and just practice, which in this case is just write. You know, mm -hmm. the more you write, the better you'll get at it, the better your your voice will become. Uh, great, good advice. Now, let's kind of sidestep uh, writing a little bit. You brought it up just now, and I meant to ask you about it earlier in the program. You mentioned that you play uh, musical instruments. Uh, tell us what kind of musical instruments do you play, Gregory? So I play violin and piano. And oh, wow. Okay. I've also sung for many years in, uh, in choirs. Um, really? And, Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So I've been very musically active my whole life. Violin. Oh, wow. I'm... I'm I've never played the violin. Uh, I used to play an organ, a little keyboard, a long okay. time ago. Yeah. That that's been a many many decades ago. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if yeah. it's like riding a bike and you don't ever forget, or if you're away from it for a while you forget. So I don't well, know. Well, you don't forget, but with violin, you um, if you don't play regularly, it, it sounds terrible when you pick pick it back up. So it's you like know. you're scraping the yeah. paint or something. <laughs> These days, since I'm not playing in an orchestra or anything right now, I'm, I mainly play piano because it's something I can just do at home and, you know, it sounds good. And, um, you know, it's, uh, also with piano, you can play the whole piece yourself, whereas with violin, you, you kind of want to be a part of something, you know, an ensemble or something like that. So, what kind of songs do you play? Like on piano, do you play classical like Tchaikovsky or Beethoven? Yeah, cla classical primarily. That's, yeah. Oh, interesting. Did yeah. you, I guess you had to take you know, lessons for that? Or did you just, mm -hmm. again, natural that too? <laughs> no, with, with music, I did take um, lessons all through, you know, my youth all the way through college. Yeah, right. I started at a very young age. You said you were in choir also? Mm -hmm. Yes. What kind of choirs so, or what kind of uh, group were you in? Yeah, so I sang for, I live in Seattle and for, um, boy, almost 20 years, I sang in wow. the, um, uh, the Catholic Cathedral Choir here oh, in, in Seattle. Wow. 
Interesting. Which is an amazing group. Um, uh -huh. I have I haven't resumed since the um, uh, the pandemic. It's been kind of you know, choir is just something that's been slow to come back. And, yeah. you know, and also my sort of schedule and priorities have changed a little bit, but, um, uh, but yeah, that's been, you know, a big part of my life for many years. Are they back together now? I mean, is it because of COVID's kind of limit in a limit? Yeah. Um, yeah, they are. It's um, I think summer is always a slow time. Um, and last year was kind of stop start. Um, but I think they are going to be back kind of fully resuming in about a, in about a month. I'm not going to join them right away. It's just, you know, sure. Other, you got too much things, on your plate <laughs> other things in my life, but you know, the, the time will probably come again. Yeah. yeah. Now I'd like to mention one thing, but uh, I'll go back to your books here in a second, but you mentioned something about your website which yeah. I'll bring uh, back up here for everybody. I thought that was interesting. I talked earlier about potential writers, ones who don't know what to do mm -hmm. or where to go. You mentioned something about uh, something about you could come in on a Zoom, talk about writing, or mm -hmm. what was that about again? Yeah, well, uh, for I've really enjoyed sometimes coming on for a Zoom with a book club. Book club, um, there it is. Yeah, okay. because um, my books have been very popular with book clubs. Uh, um, a Season of Lights in particular, I think, is a great book club read. I think um, it is. It sounds interesting. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's a good conversation starter. And on my website, there's, you know, a list of book club questions um, that you would um, probably not want to read until you read the book because there might maybe some spoilers in there. Yeah, sure. I hate but, spoilers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I've really enjoyed the times when people have had me on their, um, uh, had me in their book club meetings. And sometimes it's been local and we've, you know, gone to, uh, you know, uh, gone to a lounge somewhere and just, you know, hung out and talked, but, you know, because of, you know, zoom and, um, uh, you know, no. Facebook live and all these things, mm -hmm. we, there's no limits yeah. geographically. And so, um, actually I've done several book club meetings in Texas. Um, you know, right here, <laughs> you, there you. um, my neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. There's a, there's a group in Houston that loves all my books that have me on. And, um, uh, so I always welcome that opportunity to, um, you know, talk to people, you know, a group uh, via something like this. That's great. Uh, I want to bring in your book one more time, your most recent book, mm -hmm. uh, A Season in Life. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please check this out. Uh, you got a, a great uh, author here. He's written three interesting books. This one is his latest called A Season in Lights. Uh, highly recommend you go to his website, check out your local bookstore, and uh, make sure you do. And I'm sure uh, I hear from other authors, Gregory. I'm sure that if they, when they buy the book, uh, that they you would love for them to leave a review. Hint, 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 hint. I w I would absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, if you like the book, ladies and gentlemen, make sure you guys, you know, authors read that and don't you get even more exposure, the more reviews you get. Yes. Is that true? Yes. Especially for, um, uh, Amazon and Goodreads, um, uh, the more reviews, the more that they will sort of cross promote your book. That's great. So ladies and gentlemen, remember that don't, uh, don't forget and uh, make sure you check out his other books. I'm going to display them again, uh, from the order that he wrote them. Uh, Love of Finished Years, uh, a world uh, takes place during World War One, mm -hmm. and then you have the Exile, which takes uh, has to do with the Colombian immigrant into the United States, and then and this one, your most recent one, uh, very interesting as well, about uh, a ballet dancer in her thirties that's trying to make it, along with an older man who has kind of. You should say been there, done that, or has the experience. So every one of these, I mean, you sound like you've got some very, very interesting drawn out characters here, Gregory. Thank you. Well, well, Gregory, I appreciate you being on the show. Uh, I know yeah. my audience appreciated it too. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, once again, I can't stress it enough. Uh, make sure you check out Gregory ericphillips.com that's eric e-r-i-c-h <laughs> so make sure you check it out and, and 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 you can contact him through the website too so if there's a question for him you can leave it here on the show or you can contact him through his website as well so gregory uh, i wish you all the success and if you uh, you mentioned you might have another project coming up we'd love for you to come back on the show and share it with us thank you thank you and thanks for having me on have a good night gregory thank you thank you and ladies and gentlemen, it seems like an hour goes by way too fast on this show. Just when things get really, really interesting, here comes that one hour. But 
Hey, don't worry if you subscribe. And next Tuesday, I'll have another interesting guest with an equally interesting topic. So hit that subscribe button. And if you liked Gregory's interview tonight, uh, just don't watch it and leave. Make sure you hit that like button. Let Gregory know you've been watching. And of course, if you have a comment after the fact, you can always leave a comment here and I'll make sure that he sees it. And you can also go to his website, of course. So that's going to do it for me tonight, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad you uh, joined in. Again, it's always a pleasure to have different people here on the show to talk about their products or their talents. So that's all for me. I'm Bob Van Buren for the Van Buren Variety Show. Have a great night, everybody. Good night.